Welcome back to the Rhetoric Warriors podcast. We are teaching Americans to persuade Americans because that seems necessary. Um, complicated times require sophisticated techniques. So jump on in. We come at you from the intersection of politics, rhetoric, and comedy because that's my street corner. I've been living there for a while. That's where I hang out. Uh, you can find us on social media. I tweet jokes all day long at Twitter on uh, at Rhetoric War. There's a couple from this week. Uh, I think a field sobriety test should just be a state trooper going through your phone contacts and asking if you want to call your ex. <laughs> that's my that's my idea for the world. And then uh, I also think maybe we should just cut out the middleman and say whoever raises the most money wins the election. <laughs> Let's just skip the voting, go straight to the money in the bank. My, my name is Dr. Dan French, uh, American rhetorician. I have a rhetoric PhD. I'm an escaped professor, stand-up comedian, comedy writer from late night in Hollywood. And this podcast is designed uh, as part of the Rhetoric Warriors Project. We're trying to sign up 100 million people to teach them how to persuade because I like big goals, <laughs> big unattainable goals. That's my life choice. We talk to comedians about their politics, which is always fun. I find persuasion pros and tell you, to tell you all the secrets for magically getting people to where you want them to be. And uh, sometimes, uh, well, very often, actually, I have people on who have different views than me, and we talk, and sometimes I even try to convert them. So that's always fun. Uh, this is all about giving people more tools to talk. Persuasion and politics should not infuriate people. It should be an area where we know how to talk to each other. So that's our goal. Visit us at rhetoricwarriors.com. Uh, I sell a couple of courses over there. I'm about to launch this week uh, how to change someone's politics uh, as a course. Uh, conversion, how to do conversion, uh, one to one, one to one conversion. So that's going to be fun. My guest this week, interesting person. I've known, I don't know, I've known you for a while, right? Yeah, probably like at least six or seven years. That's what I was going to say, six or seven. It's got to be. Um, this is a, a friend of mine for a while. She lives in Vermont and Texas, and she was living in California. Uh, I knew her originally as a bookkeeper. Are you still, you're still bookkeeping, right? Yeah. Yep. At uh, iloveyourmoney.net. You can go get, your, go get your books kept. <laughs> Very politically active, uh, has run for state senator in Vermont, uh, has some causes that she cares about and strong beliefs, and that's awesome. So everybody welcome Erica Bundy Reddick. Thank you, Dan. Is that right? Is it Reddick, yeah. Reddick Bundy or Bundy Reddick? Well, I, I have uh, Bundy Reddick on like social media and stuff like that. So people who know me uh, before I got married can still find and search me. Um, so that's on Facebook. A lot of stuff just says Erica Reddick. Um, it also makes it easier because everyone spells both of my first and my last name wrong all of the time. <laughs> so having a last name like Bundy in there that's easy to spell and memorable kind of just helps with search and stuff. Yeah, it ties you into like Al Bundy and that kind of stuff, right? Ted Bundy and King Ted Kong. Ted Bundy. And, <laughs> yes. Yeah, depending on what age group depends usually on what reference people give me. That's hilarious. I think it's interesting how you never know, like one day you can just wake up and your entire life has changed because you have the wrong name. Like anybody with the last name Dahmer, you know? <laughs> yes. Things, things changed. Yeah, absolutely. Ted Bundy would work there too. Uh, it is, uh, and funny enough, uh, or not funny, I guess, depending on how you look at it. Uh, he lived in Vermont at one period of time. He was in Florida at the same time my family lived there. Um, there's a lot of weird sort of coincidences with my family that we are not even remote <laughs> related. Um, he was adopted, A, so he's not a Bundy by blood, and B, I'm also not a Bundy by blood my grandmother remarried. So I'm definitely really exceptionally not related to Ted Bundy. <laughs> I don't know. I think it sounds like you protest too much. <laughs> I do my 
like to use it in my favor sometimes when people think that they're funny. They're like, oh, like Ted Bundy. <laughs> and I'm like, yeah. And then I just stare them down. Good for you. Leave me alone. Yeah, you got to use whatever uh, life throws you. You know, that should be your, your campaign slogan. Not Ted Bundy, sister. <laughs> <laughs> I'll consider that for the next one. Yeah. Sure. So, so orient everybody. I usually start with some type of orient. And let you uh, explain, sort of explain yourself a little bit. You've got some brand. You're a little bit of a online presence and guru and self brand. And so, talk about yourself a little bit. So my, you know, I went to college for accounting, and I spent, you know, much of my early life doing account. I say early life. The last much of the last twenty years being an accountant, but I had always wanted to be involved in politics ever since I was a little girl. Uh, the first thing I really remember wanting to be was president of the United States. I would sit and watch my watch the news with my dad, you know, Dan Rather and Peter Jennings, and they'd be talking about the Iran-Contra affair and all of the other stuff. And I just thought, these people make really dumb decisions. And I think I <laughs> So as a little kid, you were like, this is stupid. These Literally. people are dumb. Yes. Uh, and spe speaking of these people are dumb, like in case anybody is confused about who it is that runs this country, there was a, a I can't remember if he's a house rep or a senator recently in an interview about stuff that was going on in Haiti and the recovery efforts from the earthquake many years ago and, and all of that kind of stuff. And this congressman literally said he was concerned about moving everyone to one side of the island to do this reconstruction because it might capsize. <laughs> okay. For those uh, listening, okay, that's not how an island works in case anybody is confused. <laughs> they don't cap. I was like, these are the people uh, running beautiful. our country. That's beautiful. Um, that's a beautiful piece of stupidity. Oh my God. It's so this is how as a 10 year old, I think I knew that I could do a better job than many of these people. And it's one of the reasons why, um, you know, I'm a small government conservative. That's what I call myself. I am a small government conservative because all midgets that these idiots, like I think all, all midget government. Is that what you're after? What's that? An all midget government. Yes, exactly. <laughs> That is I like my bold whole... new creative ideas. I think <laughs> an all midget government, nobody's tried it before. I'm just saying it can't be worse than what we've got. Peter Dinklage as president. Come on. That's I, pretty hey, good. Hey, this is what I'm saying. So, uh, but really seriously though, like it's why I am for reducing the federal government back down to the size that it was intended to be by our founders. You know, all of the decisions were supposed to be made. The majority of the decisions were supposed to be made at the state level. And we're not supposed to care as much as we do about who the president is, what Congress is doing, the idiotic omnibus spending bills that they're passing and all of that kind of stuff. So that's. So are you, do you define yourself like as an originalist? Like you always, you always take me back to, you know, the beginning of you know, the democracy and say what was intended. To me, that's kind of an originalist theory base. I would say that's pretty accurate. Um, now, that being said, and it's a republic, not a democracy. Just We'll just, we'll just start there. Talking about rhetoric. I think it should be a sheep republic. Is, Let's just put all the women in charge. What do you think? A sheep republic? <laughs> No, I wouldn't want that either. That's one of my other theories. Like women couldn't vote in this country for like, us, uh, you know, for the first 140 that's, years. Hold on, hold on, that's not accurate. Well, some women, okay, oh, property right. women, a tiny, tiny minority of women found a way to vote. Vast majority of women were disenfranchised. The vast I, majority of people were disenfranchised. Yeah, yeah, but but let's just focus on women for just a second. Okay. So, I think women should be uh, like men should be stripped of the vote for the next 140 years, and women get voting. Uh, what is it called? Recommend. Uh, Vote, they, they get the voting right since they didn't have it they get double okay. they either get two votes to every one vote or men can't vote for the next 140 years and we'll just call it a she public and go with that and why would you think that was a good idea because it balances out the injustice i i i guess i 
I, don't I, you I, want all the power? Be, Wouldn't that be great? No, no. And uh, women are not more responsible with power. I didn't all. say they were. I just said they, they're just a big you know, voting group and they were disenfranchised. So give them all the power for 140 years. Absolutely not. Women have proven to be just as irresponsible with power as men have. Because uh, the reality is that human beings are trash. And when you give them power, they act like idiots. Human beings All are things, trash. Sexual indiscretions. What's that? I said human beings are trash. I'm writing that we one are. down. <laughs> we are. We are inherently corruptible uh, and make self-interested decisions that disregard the people around us. Sometimes, for sure. Which is why government should not have as much power as they do. I'm going to bring it back to small government. <laughs> small government. That's an interesting. So I, yeah. one of the things I do as a rhetorician, like when you do rhetoric, it's like probably the first primary thing you get trained to do is split out all your statements into claims, mm -hmm. right? So every time somebody make, says something, essentially there's probably two or three claims embedded in there. Okay. And any claim can be true or false or some kind of mix, true. right? So you'll, yeah. you'll notice, I'll do this a lot. You'll say something and I'll extract, you know, a little claim out of that and go, okay, is that true, false, or is that a mix? Mm. So okay. that'll happen a lot. <laughs> All right. This is good. This is good practice. Good practice. Yeah. So what'd you say? You said human beings are trash. That's a claim. That's a good one. Yeah. And uh, government, federal government should be small. Yes. Should state government be small? I think it should be smaller. Well, I, it depends on what state we're talking about. Obviously, every state is very, very different. So the way Vermont has chosen to govern its people is very different than the way Texas governs its people versus North Dakota versus South Dakota versus California versus whatever. Yeah, so, but doesn't that make it like 50 little countries? Uh, well, we are the United States of America. But we're not the United Countries of America. Correct. So technically, the only uh, other country that resides within the United States is Texas. <laughs> yeah, Texas. Yes, it retained its, uh, its ability to, it's the only state that retained its right to secede from the country when, uh, during Reconstruction. Yeah, well, you know, that's six flags over Texas, right? It's been taken over six times. <laughs> it was a contested area. That is true. I mean, it was a Confederate state, right? I mean, like that's one of the things that took Texas was one of those flags is a Confederate flag. Um, it was part of the Confederacy. That is correct. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Texas is its own thing, man. There's there's no place politically with that kind of history or that volatility. No, nope. you know, they still want to secede, right? They're like, I'm going to take my crappy football teams and my weird hat. <laughs> I'm going to get out of here. I do think they they continue to threaten to leave. Um, and honestly, I think it's probably the only state that could, um, given it has its own port, it creates its own energy, they can grow their own food. Um, they got a lot of guns. So I don't know any other state that is as independent from the rest of the country as Texas. And I, I may be wrong. I, California? I mean, California is talking about seceding too. Yes. Um, they, however, I don't think they produce as much oil. They don't produce as much natural gas or other things needed to produce energy, basically. They got a lot of wind. Go to Palm Springs. There's a lot of wind. <laughs> from the wind farms or from the politicians who are full of crap? Well, probably either one would work, but the wind farms, man, you, you drive through Palm Springs and it's just, it's like driving through some kind of, uh, you know, wind farm world. It is really interesting to drive through Southern California with that stuff. I don't think that that produces enough energy though, does it? Like, I don't really track energy policy or energy uh, stuff. Yeah, I do know California- know kills parakeets, right? That what's that? The wind farm, they kill a bunch of parakeets or something. Oh, they kill birds generally. That's what's really interesting is a lot of people who claim to be for in the environment also push policies like wind farms that actually just 
destroy or disrupt the environment. Yeah, well, there's no way to not disrupt the environment as a human being. <laughs> like you're going to do it one way or another. That is true. That is true. We're good at it. We're very good environment disruptors. I, you know, we will, we will take over and make anything work. And the proof of that is places like Vermont and Texas. I literally, I said, I said to somebody the other day, I said, this is what's so fascinating to me. At some point, hundreds of years ago, people were crossing to the West, right? We we're going to, we're going to settle the West. And so a bunch of people were going across Texas through the desert and the plains and the lack of natural bodies of water and whatever, and the heat and the nonsense. And somebody was <laughs> but let's just stay right here. <laughs> Why? And I asked the they same thing about Vermont. They were tired. Over I guess, but I asked the same question about Vermont and places like that. Like, it's cold. It's winter. Why would you stay? Why would they have done that back in the day when there was no heat or, you know, like, I don't, I don't know. I, I don't get it either. Like, my family settled for seven generations in Kentucky. You know, it's like they took off and they're like, good enough. Don't have to read. <laughs> We're living right okay. here. Isn't Kentucky okay? So this is I'm gonna this is real ignorance. Isn't Kentucky like really pretty? Don't they have mountains and rivers and all that stuff? Oh, it's gorgeous. Everybody who finds out I'm originally from Kentucky always says the same thing. They're like, oh, it's beautiful. I drove through there once. I'm like, yeah, you drove through there once. <laughs> is what I what else is in Kentucky? It it looks like a big head of broccoli. Like the whole state is just mountains and trees and lakes. It's gorgeous. That, so there's the Kentucky Derby. So if you race horses, right? Yep. Uh, tobacco, you know. lots of tobacco. My family we were on comes from tobacco farms. Okay, and then whiskey. Um, was there's like the Noah's Ark, right? That isn't there like a yeah. That's yeah. The, the that like the creationist rock. museum is in yeah. Kentucky. That's what it is. That's yeah, what where it they is. have dinosaurs on Noah's Ark or whatever. Which is so funny. I wanted to go there when we drove through, but we didn't have time to stop. Yeah. Would you go now? Would you go there? Cause you're Christian. Would you go there yeah. as a Christian or would you go there ironically kind of as a comedian? That's a good question. Um, I, I really sincerely was curious as a Christian because I wanted to see what it was like. What does it look like? You know, I'm just just out of curiosity, just to see what it says. Sure. Is um, now that being said, there was some stuff that I read that I was like, "That's funny. That's silly. That doesn't really make any sense." So well, comedians almost all stop at that thing if they're anywhere near it. <laughs> they they go to that creationist museum. Yeah. Yeah, and that's so. And that's what you read a lot of stuff, or you hear people talk about it online. So I really just wanted to see it for myself, like. Is this as ridiculous as people say it is, or is it just a bunch of Christian haters talking smack? Can I swear, or should I keep PG thirteen? No, you're. I'm explicit. I have comedians okay. on here, so you can do whatever you want. Okay, I just wanted to make sure that I watch my mouth if I need to, and not say things like ass or whatever. <laughs> um, so yeah, I just want to see if it's like, is this real? Is this really as dumb as people say, or is it just a bunch of people who don't really understand Christianity mocking Christianity? So well, that's definitely not mocking, right? I mean, they're very authentic about this is a replica of Noah's Ark and we're presenting. No, no, no. I mean, the people that talk about it and talk oh, okay. smack articles or whatever. And it's like, oh, this is so stupid. And it's like, well, is it really stupid or do you just not understand how Christianity works? <laughs> yeah. I, I was raised Catholic, so I get a lot of, I understand Christianity because I, you know, it was in it forever. Yeah. But like, I'm not Christian now. And I'm comedian, so there's all sorts of vantage points on Christianity, and you never, you do, you never know what you're getting, you know? Well, and that's what, like, and I tell people, and I think I've shared this with you before, Dan, I grew up in a family of Christians that are the reason why people hate Christians. So I definitely get the angst that people have and the frustration, uh, because there are a lot of people who claim to be Christian who have fundamentally missed the point of the gospel. And I have to say, probably every person that I know 
specifically that is a staunch atheist, I would say at least probably 99% of them were raised Catholic and were raised in some kind of home where there, it wasn't really like the gospel being taught. It was the guilt. You Catholics don't teach the gospel? I mean, I... They I, certainly do they teach do. the gospel. They do. Maybe they do, but they also teach a lot of intolerance and um, you're going to hell. And it's like, well, yeah, but so are you because all of us are sinners saved by grace. And so <laughs> like... Yeah, I don't know. Religions, I, I, I think you know. I encourage people if if you like the mystical realm, to you know delve as far as you want. I've always looked at it and gone, yeah, that's not for me. There's yeah. too much over here in the real rational world to try to figure out. I'm too busy over here. Oh, mystical, man. I just sort of like, oh, yeah, that's fine. So it tell us, tell me, about, tell me about the whole r running for state senator in Vermont. Mm. Like, tell me the genesis of that. I know you've, like, when you were in LA, you know, you moved, you, uh, you know, you sort of tried to get into some political uh, production work and some, you know, some of that stuff. Sort of take people through your professionalizing of your interest in politics. Yeah. Great question. Um, one of the big things, probably the impetus for a lot of what's happened in the last five years was uh, doing the Purpose Project with Joe Elliott from the Catalyst Collective. So they- Wow, that's a lot of words I did not understand. <laughs> yeah, so the Catalyst Collective is an organization that works with at-risk youth and other folks. They do after-school programs and they work with other kids to help them find their purpose, to help find direction. So a lot of times, especially if you're you know, a kid that comes from a poor home and a bad community or something like that, you don't have anybody pouring into your life, helping you discover what your unique gifts and talents are and how to use the work, those things towards what you're passionate about. And so that's the thing that Catalyst does is they really help people get clear and focused on you know, what are your God-given talents and gifts and how can you use that towards something that you're passionate about? Is that a religious organization? It is not. No, they, I mean, they, the people who run it are Christian, but it's not a Christian organization. Okay. And when I did the Purpose Project with Joe Elliott, who's the executive director, leader, I was not a Christian. And in fact, it was the, the opportunity to go through, it was offered. And I literally was like, okay, but I'm not Christian. So don't try to convert me. I don't know what nonsense you're up to. I was so prickly and ridiculous about it. That How long ago was this? Seven years ago. I assumed that you've been Christian for a long time. No, nope. Only like seven years. About the so, time you met me, I drove you to uh, Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> yes, that is correct. Actually, it probably would have been before I met you. Because I... I think you were already... Yeah, I think you were a Christian when we met. So, yeah. And I'd always been like... I, so, I'll celebrate 12 years sober in a couple months. So, I'm 11 years sober this year. So, when I got sober, I started developing a relationship with God. And as I mentioned earlier, I was very anti-Christian because I grew up in a family of rotten people who claimed to be Christian. And... I'll say hurtful people who claimed to be Christian. And so I had really avoided that for a long time and been very um, anti for a long time. And then I met my husband who is Christian and we got in a lot of arguments <laughs> for <laughs> year uh, dating because I was like, oh, you know, oh, well, you know, I think Jesus was a nice guy, but you know, I mean, come on, whatever. And he'd be like, well, if Jesus is a nice guy, then he deserved to get crucified. And I was like, what? What? Say that? Ah, ooh, what? Yeah, exactly. And he said, well, if, if in fact he was just a nice, good teacher, then he deserved to be crucified the way that he was because he was claiming to be God. And in that time and in those places, like you can't just run around claiming that you're God and then getting a bunch of people to follow you and not expect to suffer repercussions for that. You clearly can. People have been doing it for a long time. <laughs> that is true. But back then, the, that was the appropriate punishment for somebody who was a heretic. And so 
So we would have all these discussions and then, um, and then I met Joe Elliott and Catalyst and did that work with them. And then it sort of, it was like, who are these people and why are they so nice to me when they really shouldn't be? And it, it piqued my curiosity. So I started going to church without Benjamin. Um, I lied to him about what I was doing on Sunday mornings. And I, um, and I just started exploring it for myself. Wait a minute. You were sneaking around on Benjamin with church? With Jesus. <laughs> yes. Yes. That is true. <laughs> and, um, and so then, and, you know, long story short, I ended up giving my life to Christ from that, um, that search for uh, deeper and greater meaning in my life. And so with that, doing the purpose project, um, you know, I realized that I didn't have to give up on all of my hopes and dreams because I had done stupid stuff in my life. Um, as I said, I'm 11 years sober. Anybody who knows anybody who's a recovering addict or alcoholic knows that we do stupid crap, uh, really stupid crap regularly. And so I thought like my whole life had, you know, I'd never be able to be in politics because I had made bad decisions in my life. And what I realized was that's not true. And it's actually because of those experiences that I've had and getting through them, getting sober, how I was able to put them to good purpose in my life and help other people, that that's actually a message people are really craving, especially in politics. They want people who are authentic and who will tell the truth, not people who will lie to them and make them feel better. Well, I mean, it depends on who you're talking to. But generally speaking, most Americans would rather you tell them the truth and be sincere than this archetype of a politician that's been developed over however long. So uh, started thinking about that. We moved to LA so that I could study to become a television host. So I studied with Marquis Costello out in LA, learned a lot of those. Of Abbott and Costello fame, which I always- yes. Do. What a great legacy to pull in for that. The oh. daughter of Lou Costello. <laughs> lucky, lucky. So right. that's what she, um, I learned a ton. Um, I also got to see, you know, I've always considered myself a liberal. I'd always considered myself a liberal. If you had asked me, I would have told you I was a Democrat, um, even though I, and voted for Republicans and really was really more of an independent. Um, but when I moved to Los Angeles and we started, as an example, experiencing discrimination, Benjamin and I experienced discrimination because we were Christian. Um, we were, uh, and, and I was starting to consider myself a, a conservative because a lot of the rhetoric that I heard out there, I was like, I don't agree with that. I don't agree with that. Like I want gay people to get married and I want everybody to be happy and healthy, but not at the expense of my constitutional rights. Like the reason we get to be so liberal is because of our bill of rights. Like that allows for people to do whatever they want and be whoever they want and do whatever silly nonsense they want, as long as they're not affecting other people's lives. So I started to sort of identify as a conservative during that time period. And then we went to this party and my husband's black, Dan, you know this, but for people who I are- I do know he's black. I've seen him multiple yes, times. Yes, in fact, he is black. So <laughs> at this party with our neighbors, we got invited to when we moved into our apartment. And this, and this guy was like, oh, all conservatives are white supremacists. And he was really dead serious. All conservatives are white supremacists. Tough claim, and big claim. Tough that, claim. Right. Yeah. Oh yeah, T very tough. And I, and I laughed. And I looked at Mino and I said, honey, did you hear that? We're white supremacists. <laughs> oh my God. Thank you so much for telling us. And I was trying to crack a joke to like lighten the mood a little sure. bit. Yeah. Just kind of like, hey, dude, be careful. You know, I'm, I'm giving you a warning shot here and I'm doing it in good faith as a joke politely, you know, but just yeah. careful. Right. That's that's your warning shot. And uh, and it sort of devolved from there. And then our neighbors wouldn't talk to us. We got ignored. They were rude. And it was like, okay. How did okay. it devolve? So what do you mean? Tell me, tell me that experience, because that's one of the experiences I'm interested in. Like when you, when people come together at these junctures of either like the far left has been overactivated 
you know, towards certain issues like that, right? Like racism. And the far right has been overactivated about certain issues like anti-Christianity. And when they bump into each other, they have no ability to talk. They have no training in talking. Correct. And that's- I'm always interested in those instances when that happens. So what happened, so a couple of the people in my building, I actually knew from the 12 step program that I am a member of. And so we actually found out about that apartment because one of the girls that lived there uh, said, posted, hey, you know, this, uh, we have an opening in our building. And I had been introduced to her by somebody from Texas in the same program. And then it was like, oh, and then this other couple who lives here, the boyfriend is in the same program. And so I started going to AA meetings. Oh, I wasn't supposed to say that. So I started going to AA uh, meetings with them and we started hanging out and doing stuff. And then we get invited to this Labor Day party. So I already had, you know, a minimal relationship with the two of them um, based around a shared, you know, struggle, if you will. And so then when we went to this party and then they started talking a bunch of trash and we were like, well, okay. And then I cracked the joke and then the conversation continued and they were asking us questions and it was like, well, what about this? Well, what about this? And then whatever. Well, they stopped talking to either of us. Uh, they would walk by and not acknowledge that we were standing right there. Um, they started complaining to the landlord that we were, so Benjamin is a fight choreographer and stunt person. So we, he and our roommate at the time were doing sword practice in the parking lot. <laughs> you know, it's shared space. It's the parking lot. It's the parking lot. They complained to the landlord that they were using it. And so I was like, is there a problem? Like, and I just asked him like, Hey dude. Um, I heard that this is a problem for you. Is it, is it the noise? Was it, were you guys trying to rest? And this is keeping in mind, this is our upstairs neighbor who has, we're in a crappy old building in LA, Right. They run their, um, treadmill throughout the day, which shakes the whole house and actually shorted out our light in that bedroom. And they have a dog that continuously barks when they leave it alone. So you guys are obnoxious, terrible neighbors. And we don't say anything because, you know, it's thin walls. You just learn to deal with it. But then once you hear we're conservative, now you're going to complain to the neighbor that we're utilizing the common area and that it's a problem. Not because we're being too loud, not because we're being disruptive, not because you can't utilize it, just because you're being a jerk. So um, I wasn't invited to AA meetings with them anymore. Oh my God, I did it again. So I wasn't invited. I think people anymore. have heard those letters together. Before. I know, but I it's part okay. of the tradition. You know, it's... it's uh, We're not talking about batteries. We know that. To remain anonymous, except, you know, the level of press, radio, and film. So, um, they call so, it Alcoholics Anonymous, but everybody knows about it. It's whatever. <laughs> so... Um, so yeah, so that was what happened there. And so I find that a lot like California, you know, there's a lot of that on the West coast. Like I dated somebody who had moved to Austin from Oakland and she was what I would call a, you know, a hypersensitized uh, left liberal. And so, you know, comedians, anything that wanders in front of our face, you're going to try to turn it into a joke. It doesn't matter. Like there's no morality in, in comedy. There's just, can you turn that into a joke? Correct. And so uh, I had to tell her, I'm like, well, you know, I, we got to stop hanging out. Like, you're no fun to talk to. <laughs> like, you're calling me out on things that have a very thin, you know, uh, un immorality to them. Like, if you if you drag it over here, yeah, you can make me into a bad person. But what I just said was not that. You're just sort of amplifying it. And the so left it's very difficult. It's a difficult community to talk to, but anybody who gets hyper sensitized to an issue becomes difficult to talk to. It's, it's like, it's like you're, a t here's, here is what I think happens is people begin to identify themselves as their belief structure or as their opinions. Like if I, and I found this especially true on the left, I'm not saying it's not true on the right. Uh, and I'll get to that, but I found it especially true with people on the left. Like if they don't far have, left, far left, 
if they don't have a foundation for their personhood outside of the things that they believe, they will lose their mind because if you attack an opinion of theirs or you question it or you crack a joke about it, well, you're actually attacking them as a human being. And it's like, nah, dude, that's, it's, I just disagree with you about that thing. Um, now yeah, and it's, and it's, it's interesting to watch. Like I, I, I have, again, rhetoric training, you know, gives you all these realms to apply theory from. And so one of the things is story, like myth and the Greeks mm. called mythos. And so most people don't really have rational beliefs. Like they don't have highly cognitive, logically worked out through a, a very strong logical system because that's difficult. What they have is stories. And so in stories, yep. you have good and evil. You have heroes and villains. And the right is the left's villain. Now, it doesn't matter whether it's accurate, whether you're a villain or not. What matters is that in their story, you occupy a clean, clear villain space. So as soon yes. as you get put in there, they, they assume everything and they, they change the way they approach because you treat villains differently than either people in neutral in the middle or heroes. And, and they just don't have a way of of moving you around and being more complicated or sophisticated no, about it than that. There's no, there's no nuance allowed. So even in movies, well, maybe not these days, but in general, even villains in a movie are sympathetic. They're, you know, usually the director or the writer wants to yeah, make- There's them. a little bit in there for you to, yeah. Right, there's something like you, uh, oh, wow. Yeah, I mean, I wouldn't land there, but I understand how a person could get to that point. Well, and that's a really good point. Like in Joker, right? Yes. They spent the whole movie Joker showing you how this guy had just been beat down. And then when he finally went insane and started killing people, you're like, oh, okay, I see some reason here. You know, but that, that like you said, it takes the story and it adds in enough detail and background that people have a more sophisticated way of understanding it. And then usually a more sophisticated way of communicating with you. But, the, like but I'm not willing. To, they just dropped it. Yeah, exactly. That like people are not willing to ha allow for people, human beings to be nuanced. People are either all good or all bad because that <clears throat> that fits neatly into my belief structure. And then I don't have to work for it. I don't have to have sympathy, empathy or compassion for you. I can just sit over here and be right no matter what happens. Yeah, it's a it's a tough psychology these days. Like I that's one again, one of the reasons why I like to have people with different beliefs than me on the podcast. Yeah, because I have a like I said, I have a course in how to convert people, you know, how to change people from their politics, because that's one of the things people want to be able to do. And it's America. You're supposed to try to convert people. It's yeah. a persuasion based <laughs> culture and society. And that shouldn't be, you know, threatening to people. It's not about attacking somebody. It's understanding but, them and giving them reasons why you think maybe they should believe something different. But that's the thing is, remember, if, if your starting point is, I have to protect myself at all costs. So you even saying anything that's remotely different than what I believe is a personal attack. It's a personal assault. And so I immediately go into fight or flight mode because- yeah. Oh, yeah, that's absolutely right. Yeah. And I, and I say now, Dan, I want to just say, I pick on the left a lot because I consider myself a conservative. So I consider myself right of center, but I have just as many frustrating argumentative conversations with my people on the right who consider themselves, you know, staunch conservatives or Republicans or whatever. And it's like, okay, but you don't even understand why you believe what you do. No, they don't. That's why I said like, People can't track things in the cognitive system anymore. It's too complicated. There's too much going on. There's too many different sources coming at them. And so you see these weird, mm. you know, adjustments that people make, which is to just believe something and not allow it to open up again to any other input. You know, you see it on the right and the left. It's, oh, yeah. It's, a, it's almost well, like a, a survival mechanism, a cognitive survival mechanism. It, it absolutely is. And at a time, this is, <clears throat> and I'll say, I will cop to be, I, I was one of those people. So I remember when I first moved back to Vermont in 2018, 
And I was at Thanksgiving dinner at my sister's house and I ended up screaming. <laughs> yes. So at Thanksgiving. Like, yeah. That's, Thanksgiving. that has to be the, that, that's probably what 50% of the country probably. ends up screaming at Thanksgiving. So this guy who's a friend of theirs was just attacking me as a Christian, attacking me as a conservative. And at that time period, I was, you know, not well emotionally, right? I, Mino and I were, were having some troubles and we were trying to work that stuff out. And then I moved back and like, it's all, you know, to Vermont and things are awkward and I had health problems. Um, and so I was like sick and, you know, I just was not well. And at the time I did not realize that I had made my political beliefs and my opinions and my experiences the foundation of my personhood. And, and, and that's when I, when I screamed and made the biggest ass out of myself, basically got uninvited from my sister's house who like wouldn't talk to me for a month because I was such an <laughs> asshole. And I really was. I mean, I yeah. just lost it. And, and what I realized was I've made my belief systems and all this stuff me rather than as, as a Christian, and I'll speak as a Christian, my belief about my self-worth and where my values come from and all that stuff is supposed to be rooted in Jesus. And so if I am so fragile and so, so not relying on God that I can let some idiot say something rude to me and I let that be who I am or believe or part of my, what I believe about myself. It's like, why do I care what this jerk face says about me? The only person I should care about what they say about me is God and Jesus. And so that actually started a whole other set of like learning and growth in my relationship with God, because I said, if, if my foundation and all of my self-worth comes from what people think of me, I'm never going to make it in anything that I really want to do. Well, and you've got, you know, for a lot of the, a lot of the left, you've got a few trigger areas, right? You've got Christian, that's going to be a trigger area. A lot of people, and it's, it's sort of what you've talked about. Like there are a lot of bad people who self-identify as Christians and ergo it stains Christianity. So that's a, that's a, a villain category for a lot of people on the left. Yep. Uh, you've got conservative, like when you start talking about the constitution and originalism and those kind of <laughs> things, you're going to trigger, you know, the left like crazy, you know, you've got a lot of stuff that would like to me, like the first way you do conversion with people, if you're, if you're interested in changing somebody over to something else is you start by like this, like just doing information, just find out about them. No yeah. judgment you know, cause you have to understand why they are as they are and how they got there. And, and then maybe you can start making some decisions about how to have a relationship or how to talk. Yeah. And then you're like, okay, uh, maybe there's something in there, like the constitution, you know, you've talked to me quite a bit about this and you're involved now with a, a constitutional push, some kind of organization. Right. And so I, I might be like, okay, well, let's take a look at constitutionality. Like we did this a little bit via, um, Facebook, where I was asking you about guns, and I'm like, "Well, Jesus, would Jesus have had a gun?" You know, and you're like, eh. "But yes. that kind of stuff, it, it's only they, just for the record." The disciples were armed; like they did not run around and just be like, "We're just gonna take it." Yeah, but Jesus didn't like that. Remember, like he cut off the ear, and he's like, "Dude, don't go cutting off ears." Um, so the but the thing is, like, you can have those kind of discussions; they become palatable because you've taken the time to understand somebody to create a little bit of a relationship and it's not threatening, you know, yes. so that you've got some common ground to be able to talk. And that's to me, like, if you're going to convert somebody, that's what you need. Like if you want to convert somebody to Christianity, which, you know, the Christian tradition is very proselytizing and very conversion oriented. You're trying to bring people to Jesus. A lot of people are very strong about that. Go down to sixth street back before the pandemic and watch the, families with their posters, you know, trying to get people to, you know, turn away from evil alcohol. Um, so it's, you know, it's a very common thing for wanting to bring people over to a, a more correct, viable thing that you believe in. 
I just want to give people the ability to do it without yelling, like you're saying. Right. Giving. So. Right. Well, and that's the thing is if you don't understand someone's values, how can you even start to talk about them or to talk to them about anything? You know, this was one of the biggest lessons that I learned in my campaign for state Senate. Um, I was at this event and it was for the person running for lieutenant governor on the opposite side. So I ran as a Republican, she ran as a Democrat for lieutenant governor and she invited everyone to the event. And so I was like, sweet, I, if, if it's, you know, Molly Gray supporters, I'll get to talk to them. If it's people who are anti Molly Gray, I'll get to talk to them too. Like, I'm just gonna go. And I remember this young lady, I said something about small businesses or taxes. I don't remember what I said. But she was like, see, that's part of the problem. You Republicans don't get it. You know, you got to, you, who, who cares about taxes? Who cares about small businesses? Why should I care? You guys have nothing else to talk about but that. And I was like, and it went, bing. I went, oh my God. We Republicans, I say, I'll say we Republicans, conservatives, we're trying to talk to young people, Democrats, the left, in terms of our values, we're using our language and our values to try to get win them over to our side, but they don't value the same stuff. They don't value things in the same way. They have these other ideas about how things are supposed to go. And so what I, in that moment, I went, oh my God, I have to be talking to people, especially in Vermont, which is highly progressive uh, and left generally, I have to talk to them in terms of their values and show them why conservative ideas will better be able to get them the things that they value. Okay, you want, uh, you know what? Conservatives care about the environment too. So this was one of the things I did a series called Debunking Myths About Conservatives. And the first one was, uh, you know, conservatives don't care about the environment. And I said, much to the contrary, I grew up in Vermont. I'm a conservationist. My sister went, you know, for environmental science. I'm paraphrasing. You know, my problem comes when the state has decided that solar panels are the way to do this. When we see the evidence of the toxic waste and all these other things, but more importantly, this has become a wealth transfer from the poor and middle class to the wealthy. Because the only people, you know, the state is providing subsidies in the form of tax, you know, we pay taxes to pay subsidies for people to get solar panels put on their house. But the only people who can afford solar panel installation and, uh, and maintenance are rich people. So you're taking money from the poor and middle class and giving it to the rich. And I'm not okay with that. So what other ways can we improve the environment, reduce our carbon footprint and all of that stuff that does not involve a wealth transfer from the poor to the rich? Yeah, and that's why I said, like, when you get into, when you start to deep dive into the issues and try to understand, you know, so you just made a claim like that, that one about, you know, um, harvesting tax money from the middle class to pay for wealthy people's, you know, sun panels. Yes. And God knows if that's true or not, you know? I don't know if it's true. Is it true in Vermont? Is it, is it true everywhere? Like, what is the actual tax base? Then you get to this sort of wonk politician, you know, like, uh, what's her name? Katie Porter, I think, the one who has the, uh, she always brings a whiteboard out when she does questioning of people in Congress. Oh, I don't know. And she's, she's an accountant. She has a financial background. And she's oh, gained a lot of, you know, sort of notoriety because she always brings a whiteboard when she interviews somebody and just reams them on the evidence of their claims, you know, and it's like, okay, you said this, well, let's take a look at what it actually is. And then she'll pull up receipts and she'll pull up, you know, actual numbers and that kind of stuff. And that kind of wonk sort of deep expert, you know, numerical quantitative expertise, which is sort of your background with accounting. You cannot yep. just guess at your, your accounting numbers. <laughs> No, you not know, if a, not if you want to not go to jail. <laughs> it's a really good foundation, you know, to create beliefs from, create mm -hmm. policies from. It's just almost nobody has it anymore. Yeah, it's it's more important. It seems like these days 
to have policy ideas or initiatives that make people feel good or look like you're doing something rather than making sure that it's actually effective. And yeah, and it's kind of become like politics. If you look back in the 70s and you know the history of politics, it was very boring. It was very wonky. It was very like if you watched C-SPAN, uh, nobody ever watched C-SPAN because it was the most boring meetings ever presented to human human beings. And we can't take that via our, you know, video and our social media and things like that. But that is what government is supposed to be. Like exactly what you just said. Like, okay, we'd like to get more solar panels into the world. They seem to be good. Now they're going to people say, well, I have problems with solar panels. And you're like, okay, well, let's look at those problems. Over here, you know, I think we shouldn't pay for people's solar panels, you know, because I have a problem with that. And then people would go in and look at the numbers and make a decision based on actual information, but we don't yeah. have any actual information anymore. <clears throat> well, and that's especially, especially in Vermont, and I see this on the federal level too, is like, there is a, we don't look at second and third order effects anymore. So this is part right. of, if it sounds good, right? So, okay, <clears throat> solar panels don't create carbon emissions. Okay, well, what's required to make a solar panel? Uh, a ton of carbon, like sure. way more carbon and human suffering than is saved by using the solar panel in the first place. Yeah, it, who knows? So then you got to you got to start writing it out as a ratio, right? You got to have some mm -hmm. kind of actual numbers. And you're not allowed to have that conversation because what ha the, the, the rhetoric eh, is that if you question any of that stuff, you're a racist, sexist, homophobic, bigot, fill, xenophobe, whatever, fill in the blank. Well, let oh, me give you a tool for being able to do that. Let me give you a, What's that? let me give you a rhetoric tool for being able to have those discussions. Okay. Okay. So there's first order of reaction that people have to you. And that's going to be their super trained, you know, sort of story based, ignorant, you know, kind of reaction. They've been trained right. to that. Right. So you introduce yourself as a conservative or whatever, let them have a little bit of that reaction. So the rhetorical tool is validate them. So yes, I'm a racist. <laughs> well, you can validate in a lot of ways. Oh, like I, mean, I would give you two tools, like a, you can do a validation with a qualifier. Okay. So a validation with a qualifier would be like, yes, there is a lot of uh, history of racism in conservative movements and in the GOP and in, you know, politics in general, you know, so you validate it, but okay. you qualify it. There's also a big history of people who are not racist on the conservative side, you know, and therefore yeah. like people, people will lose their minds in conversations because they don't get validated. Interesting. Oh my God. Oh my God. That's even, I mean, that's, that, that is like marriage 101. Right. Right. It's, it's Even basic like communication principles. Okay. Hold on. I'm sorry. My mind is getting blown right now because that's not even, I mean, that's even like in comedy, you know, in improv and stuff, it's yes. And it's, it's relational advice. It's, Oh, wow. Okay. I'm listening. You're just blowing yeah. my mind right now, Dan. I'm not well, gonna... in rhetoric, like the, the secret of rhetoric is that it's the study of language and language processes and communication. It's just yeah. applied in big, you know, big settings like politics. People forget their basics when they go over into politics and therefore they can't communicate. So like if you had said to your neighbors in California, hey, really sorry, you know, for being conservative. Uh, you know, I know it's hard for some people. Can we talk about it? You know, mm -hmm. so then they I may have actually had a conversation. So if I hadn't just made fun of them, basically, and tried to make a joke out of it? Yeah, you know, jokes, if it's a good joke, you get a good laugh. Well, I guess not when it's at somebody else's expense that you don't really know that well. Maybe that wasn't <laughs> very good. Oh, but controlling your, your talk so that you get the effects that you want, you know, is, again, that's... Oh! Okay, all right. This is cool. I'm excited. So then what else? So validation, and then what else? Well, qualifier, like I said, that's how you get into people's brains. Okay, so you yeah, like you say, yeah, I, I understand why you think that way. And that's great because it's true, but it's also not true. And so that's the qualifier because they can't argue against that. 
there's no way of saying every conservative on the planet throughout all of history is a white supremacist. That's yeah, that's just not. Nobody would argue that. Some people would, though, Dan. It's just because they, like I said, they're doing their first level non-logical reactions. Let them have that, <laughs> but they won't stay with <laughs> it because nobody, will, nobody would make that claim. Okay. All right. I'll let you have that. Because nobody likes to look completely stupid. <laughs> that is true. Well, and I think that's one of the things that's been frustrating for me is like, given the fact that I've always been a liberal and I still consider myself a liberal. And I made a video about this. I say, I'm a conservative because I'm a liberal. Like I volunteered for Vermont Freedom to Marry. It was an organization. So Vermont was the second, it was the first state in the union to pass civil unions, which was the marriage equivalent. And it was the second state to pass marriage equality, just generally. I think we ought to just outlaw all marriage. That's what I, I vote. I, well, this I don't think it should be. I don't think it should be up to the state. I personally, it was a religious institution originally. I think it should go back to being a religious institution. And if secular people want to get uh, into a contract that allows for them to get their spouse's stuff when the person dies or whatever, then that's a marriage contract. Then that's a then that is a a union. It's just a civil agreement. You don't have to call it a marriage. It's just an agreement. Exactly. So this is, so that's where I stand on that. But, you know, I, I'll even argue with some conservatives and say, no, dude, the state does not get to discriminate. Period. That is unconstitutional. Okay. It's in our constitution. A. B. It's just not right. So you can't say one marriage is okay, but another isn't, and then have some feelings about it, write all your tax law to, to do social engineering for same, uh, for, uh, heterosexual couples, blah, blah, blah. Like th that too bad, you know? And that's why I say like, it was especially hurtful to me when some people that I literally volunteered for that I gave time and energy and fought to have equal, uh, marriage basically would then turn around and say, well, but you don't get to worship the way that you want. And you don't get religious freedom in the sure, but but yeah, but everybody's going to do that. Just remember, everybody has pockets of villainy, and it, and a lot of it's based on ignorance, and they don't understand. So it's your yep. job to validate them, add some qualifiers, and then start giving them information so that you've got common ground. Yep. I mean, that's really what politics should be, you know. So that if you do want to change people, if you want to create some conversion, here's some techniques which will you know help you actually do it. So. I love it. I'm really excited for that. All right. Well, we've been talking about an hour, um, so I'm going to let you go. I, okay. I keep bringing people back. I want you to come back because there's there's so much stuff to talk about. Yeah. Um, and it's always fun to, uh, again, talk are about. You, are you trying to convert me, Dan? Is that what's happening? Are you? Yeah, I convert, to, I convert everybody. <laughs> <laughs> convert for people from the left, too. I'm a walking conversion tool. <laughs> I love it. So, uh, but yeah, appreciate it. Like, awesome. like it's a really interesting stuff and um, I'll yeah, have you back you. on and we'll talk about it some more. I love it. So go to uh, hire, hire uh, Erica for your bookkeeping. I love your money.net. And uh, yes. I will talk to you again soon. Thanks yeah. everybody and for, yeah. They can check out my political stuff at generally irritable on Facebook, uh, YouTube and um Instagram. So Facebook and YouTube are the primary places right now. I'll be switching over to some of the other platforms eventually, but for right now, generally irritable. <laughs> generally irritable with Erica Bundy Reddick. Go check. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. We'll see you. All right. Thanks, Dan. Yep. Thanks, Erica.